Thank you for joining us again today. And um, just a few brief comments. Um, as we all know, the entire county from Woodway to Darrington, Stanwood uh, to uh, Index have been negatively affected, but um, it, it, it's helpful to step back and remember that the entire region and state, country and world is uh, suffering through um, and from the COVID virus. So we are not alone in this. Um, we've had over 200 fatalities in Snohomish County and many other families have had to deal with members who have been gravely ill. <clears throat> many others people have lost their jobs and really seen their lives change and, and some of their dreams vanish. So we have major manufacturers uh, severely affected all, all the way down to mom and pop stores and restaurants and service workers. Um, really is nobody's untouched uh, by the economic downturn that we're uh, facing. Right now we've got a lot of families with school-aged children who are worried about how to juggle work and homeschooling uh, and the challenges that remote learning uh, really presents to all of us. So it's been an extended shock to our community. Again, there's only two ways out. Um, a readily available and effective vaccine <clears throat> or the widespread use of masks and social distancing. So there really are no shortcuts. Uh, there are no cheats or easy solutions. Uh, really no videos or messages we can give to people beyond please. Uh, we are a country that can get things done. We have a can-do spirit. We have faced many challenges uh, over the years. We've sent people to the moon, uh, vehicles to Mars. We've cured complex diseases before, uh, but it all takes time and it takes effort and it takes us all pulling together. So again, um, wear a mask, uh, encourage uh, and uh, more than encourage others around you to do the same. Socially distance, uh, we can really conquer this by being selfless and thinking about those around us. So um, <clears throat> we've also really been uh, working hard to tackle the economic downturn. We've rolled out two rounds of grants for small businesses uh, and one grant program for aerospace companies. <clears throat> We're gonna try to do more if the federal government can really get a bill passed and, and assist us, we need that desperately. Uh, we've also rolled out a grant to help retrain workers who have been furloughed or laid off because of the pandemic. Uh, I've set up an Office of Economic Recovery and Resiliency, and we're working on uh, making sure that we're ready and doing everything we can to help our communities. We've also established an Economic and Workforce Recovery Task Force uh, that uh, brings in our partners and others from around the county to assist us in uh, really mobilizing our resources to help businesses and workers and families. Uh, we've purchased over Million, well, millions of pieces of PPE for our frontline workers. And uh, we've also established a food distribution program. So we've been really scrambling to um, mobilize and respond as best we can. Uh, because of disruptions to travel, our local aerospace companies, including Boeing, are hurting. Um, I've called a meeting of the Snohomish County's Aerospace Task Force for this Thursday. We're going to be making our case for why Snohomish County is really the best most profitable place to make airplanes. And um, we really want to encourage uh, Boeing to look long and hard on the quality of workers we have here in Snohomish County. We have over 50 year history with Boeing here in Snohomish County. And we'd like to see that go for another 50. So we're gonna to continue to do as much as we can to uh, help our communities, our businesses. Uh, and really um, we're, we know that we're in this for the long term. It's gonna take a while, but we're gonna keep um, keep working hard at it. So if people don't wear masks, don't maintain social distancing, then all these efforts are really going to be for naught. So please uh, continue to do that uh, and be vigilant about that. And our numbers are turning around as Dr. Spitters will mention, we're, we're headed in the right direction. So kudos to all of you. Thank you for um, really taking this seriously, uh, but keep it up. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Spitters. Hey, thank you, Executive Summers, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd just like to give you an update about uh, the recent data related to COVID-19 and uh, 
with our conveners uh, help possibly. I'm going to try to share the screen just to show a couple of slides. So this will take just a second here. All right, so you uh, hopefully now are seeing a, a slide that shows a green line, which is the, the case rate uh, over time moving from left to right from March up through the present and in two week rolling intervals, meaning every week we look at the prior two weeks, add up all the cases, and then calculate a rate per 100,000 for that two week period. And each one of those is a is a point on that line moving from left to right. So, as uh, I'm not sure if you can see my pointer, but as we went through the initial wave of of uh, COVID-19 in March and April, things peaked, came down slowly, and then we were in this very good space here during May and early June, and then things picked up again uh, shortly after we moved into phase two. Uh, we had six consecutive weeks of increasing case rates, peaking uh, in, in late July at uh, about 98 cases per 100,000 per two weeks. Uh, the next uh, week it was basically flat. And then this past week, uh, the, the two weeks going from last Saturday back 14 days, uh, uh, things appear to be turning around. So that's, uh, that's a good signal. Uh, as, as Executive Summers mentioned, and, and uh, not, not least of all uh, important is uh, the efforts of the community to reduce the gathering sizes, wear the face masks, uh, and, and distance ourselves from one another in public. Now this, this graph is really a, 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 uh, a breakdown of the prior graph into age groups. And the key thing I just want to show you is that these groups all here are, are younger age groups. The, the orange group is the, the 20 to 29 age group that we think kind of fueled the last rise uh, through a combination of probably returning to customer facing work uh, and work settings where they're around others their same age as well as probably some indulgence and gatherings that were um, of a frequency and size that we would not recommend. Over time, that worked its way both down the age chain into these uh, younger individuals, adolescents and children, as well as in, to folks in their 30s and 40s. And what we've seen in the last week or two is that that appears to have flattened out and is coming down. Now we really need to see that continue to come down for uh, another couple of weeks before I think we can really say with confidence that that's not just a, an aberration, but it's certainly a good signal that uh, the community's efforts to get things under control uh, have helped. Uh, additional features um, that might have contributed to this decline are the, the case investigations and, the, and the, uh, the contact notifications and quarantines and so that's that's been very helpful. One uh, possible uh, warning signal, something that we're remaining vigilant about, is in these older age groups in the in the dark blue, those in their 50s, and then the, the green uh, folks um, uh, over 60. Uh, that appears to have flattened out, but the, over the long run, you can see that there's a slower increase than in the younger age groups and a less impressive uh, change in, and that's again because those are our, our age groups that are more likely to end up in the hospital, higher frequency of other medical conditions that make hospitalization or severe illness more likely. Uh, that's really what, what you know, our whole control effort is about, has been trying to prevent that. So we'll, we'll keep a, a keen eye on, especially on these age groups in the coming weeks. Uh, this is just uh, to show you, I want these rows are weeks over time over the past couple of months. These are the total numbers of tests done in the county and the positivity rate. And we just want to highlight a couple of things for you here. First, the, the total number of cases diagnosed has re remained essentially the same over the past several weeks. The number of tests went down, as you may recall in prior weeks, 
we've mentioned that there's a somewhat of a log jam in the national commercial uh, COVID testing system. And so that, uh, and in some uh, uh, laboratories are having problems getting a hold of reagents or other materials necessary for doing the testing. So that led uh, virtually all clinical settings to back away from widespread testing of asymptomatic individuals and asymptomatic people are only being tested in a targeted nature now, like if they're a close contact, a part of an outbreak, that sort of thing. And so uh, we think that that's what's driven this decline of about uh, a third in the number of tests over the, the third to the fourth week of July. Um, and uh, correspondingly, we've had an increase in the percent positive, but the total number of positives is roughly stable. Uh, what we're potentially not detecting are some asymptomatic cases, but again, uh, we, the targeted asymptomatic testing, looking at folks who are more likely to be infected, close contacts, part of an outbreak, that should still be occurring, and so we shouldn't be missing too many of those. So uh, part, uh, most of the increase in the percent positive has really been driven by this decline in the number of people being tested, the vast majority of whom are asymptomatic. Uh, last slide I want to show you is just the hospitalization rates. You see this up and down uh, nature. It's a very relatively small numbers. We've got, uh, when we peaked in, in um, well, we actually peaked back in March. That's not on this graph, up at around 100 people in the hospital at one time. Things gradually came down to where we reached a low of about 20 in, in uh, early July, and things have in an up and down fashion, but the overall trend is up and is somewhat consistent with that, that other slide I showed you with the older age groups over this same time period having a slight increase. So again, this and the, the incidents in the older age groups are the key factors that we're, we're keeping an eye on going forward. Um, so cautious optimism about where things are going. It seems that, that all the efforts of uh, the community, public health, uh, workplaces, and other places where people are congregating are maybe starting to have benefits. And like Executive Summers, I urge us all to follow that guidance, especially around the use of face coverings in public, staying six feet away, and limiting our social circles really to you know, five people or less and keeping that a stable group over time. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to uh, hand it over to Therese Quinn, who's with our, the Health District's Public Health Emergency Planning and Response Program. She's the coordinator for the Medical Reserve Corps. And Thank you. I need to unshare here. Um, Okay, thank you very much. I don't know if you've heard of the Medical Reserve Corps before, um, but it's a group of volunteers who our mission is to supplement the healthcare system in times of crisis. And the Health District has had the Medical Reserve Corps unit since 2007, and that's when I started working um, at the Health District. Um, we've done different kinds of work. When we're in steady state, we do things like have uh, first aid stations and more fun things like that. Um, however, uh, Medical Reserve Corps volunteers have worked in different types of disasters um, since 2007. When there was flooding that happened back in 2007 and 8, our volunteers staffed um, emergency call centers. Um, then when the slide happened near Oso, our volunteers again helped in the emergency call center, they worked in the operation center, um, emergency operation center, they assisted in other um, things uh, at clinics and behavioral health support. Um, and they've also worked at the cold weather shelters um, in Monroe and Snohomish. So our volunteers um, have done a lot of different things. Um, but since January when we had uh, COVID come, uh, we have had over 200 volunteers active in this response, and they have worked over 15,000 volunteer hours. 
Um, they've done a lot of different things in that. They started out working at the emergency call center. Um, we had them working on um, supporting logistics, working as couriers, running uh, test kits to facilities and taking uh, specimens to the lab, different types of things like that. We've had them work on um, testing operations, which is our biggest thing that we're doing now. Uh, they've also worked at the warehouse. We're helping um, all kinds of different operations, also screeners. So Providence Hospital has asked MRC volunteers to come help their staff provide screening at their entrances at uh, Pacific Campus, and they're also doing that at the health district. So um, a lot of people think that Medical Reserve Corps are all doctors and nurses, and we do have doctors and nurses, but we have a lot of other people that help as well. And we have, uh, we have interpreters. We'd love to have more interpreters. Um, we have people that have other licenses, but we have most of the people that are volunteers are not medically licensed, and they do amazing work. Um, I, I, I'm very impressed with the work that volunteers do, um, and they come out and they help out. Um, I, I, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm very humbled by working in this job because I get to work with people who give their time for free to help the community. And it, it's just so rewarding to work with people like that. Um, so we do need more volunteers as we are continuing to work um, in the response. The testing has, it's very labor intensive um, and takes more people, especially when there's more people coming through. So we're always welcome to have new volunteers. We'd love to have doctors and nurses and interpreters and anybody who wants to help. We're very flexible. We want to meet people um, where they are to be able to, whatever their schedules are, I'm sure we can find a, a job for people to do. So thank you very much. Thank you, Therese, uh, great work. Really, really kudos to the whole team, thank you. Um, We've got a question uh, for Dr. Spitters. Um, the state has not been posting negative test results due to issues with its database. Are the state's problems impacting the health district in measuring the virus's spread in the county? And if so, in what way? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, this morning I just spoke with our lead epidemiologist about, about this uh, matter. The, the, uh, there, the state is having some problems with the electronic uh, laboratory reporting labs, positive and negative results for COVID, as well as positive results for all other notifiable conditions that are required to be reported by laboratories come to the state health department through an electronic portal. And, and then their dis county of origin is, is determined and they're distributed out to us to investigate we're getting all the positives, so it's not really interfering with our uh, di immediate disease control interventions. We certainly all want, you know, uh, precise, accurate numbers in the long run, but in the short run, uh, uh, glitches like this have occurred from time to time, and, you know, we get back on track and catch up, and I anticipate that that's what will occur this time. So no short-term impact on our disease control efforts, and long term, I think it'll be a non-issue as we we get the problem resolved and and uh, finalize those numbers that any numbers that are currently inaccurate as a result of that. Another question for you, Doctor. Um, on Wednesday, visitation will be allowed at long-term care facilities. Um, as it was a state uh, decision this week. You reported outbreaks of several such facilities. How will you let residents and their family members know visitation will not be allowed there for a few weeks where there are outbreaks? Yeah, so, you know, the, 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 the state guidelines for visitation are, are also phased, much like the Safe Start plan. So there's a, essentially now a Safe Start plan for long-term care facilities that addresses visitation and other activities in long-term care facilities, such as skilled nursing facilities, assisted living, adult family homes. 
and, and other like settings. That, uh, that um, the phases of that uh, progression are independent of the county's status with respect to other uh, aspects of public life. So we're in phase two uh, countywide for in general with respect to COVID-19, but because our case rate in Snohomish County exceeds 75 per 100,000 per two weeks, we are in phase one of the long-term care facility program. And therefore, uh, although that plan goes into effect Wednesday, the framework goes into effect, visitation in long-term care facilities in Snohomish County, countywide does not change. Uh, visitation can be remote via electronic means, outdoors, uh, and, uh, and then these, these window visits that some places uh, permit. All of those, anything that's outdoors or the window visit is physically distanced by six feet and involves uh, use of face coverings. Uh, but, and then uh, congregate activities within long-term care facilities like group dining, group activities, are still discouraged in phase one. So really there should be no change in activities in Snohomish County long-term care facilities, outbreak or not, uh, in any given facility until we get a little bit further down the road here. Executive summary. There we go. <clears throat> Think after six months, get this. Uh, for Dr. Spitter, explain again why the 9% positive rate is not alarming. Well, I didn't say, well, maybe I did, I can't remember if I said it wasn't alarming or not. It certainly draws attention when you go from 5.8% up to 9%. That's, a, you know, our goal is to be 2% or less. Uh, uh, and, and so we're, we're above that. Now, uh, the total number of positives has remained stable over the past three weeks. The amount of testing went down. Uh, we'd like to see more testing occurring. So I think that's concerning. It bears watching. Uh, this recent decline that we've witnessed in case reports uh, certainly could be um, uh, uh, a, an artifact of less testing and, and occurring. And if that's the case, uh, time will tell. So I think uh, not alarming, but certainly concerning, merits attention and vigilance and uh, will continue to watch. But, uh, 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 you know, our goal is to get the percent positive and the total number of cases being reported and transmission in the community down. So any increase in the percent positive is a step in the wrong direction. Uh, there you have it. Great. <clears throat> Are there any more questions? Anybody have any more questions? Got a couple minutes left. Okay, uh, regarding long-term care visitation, the state has said visits could start Wednesday if a facility has not had a new case in 28 days and enough PPE. Are you saying that the health district will prevent visitation on Wednesday until it can verify those situations? Uh, well, we'll I think we'll have to discuss that. Uh, my understanding of the, is that the, the plan goes into effect Wednesday. But one of the parameters is uh, assigning a phase to a county. And those visitations uh, that are afforded in the plan beginning Wednesday only take effect in a county that's in long-term care phase two, which we are not in. We're in long-term care phase one. So uh, we'll certainly send the signal to the uh, Department of Social and Health Services that regulates the uh, the long-term care facilities, but there would be no uh, under the under the governor's framework, uh, which we all uh, are under and cannot be less restrictive than. Uh, there can be no in indoor person-to-person -person visitation in long-term care facilities, at least until we get down below 75 cases per hundred thousand for two weeks. Okay, uh, we've got two more uh, to wrap it up. And I, I think you've addressed this, but just to be absolutely sure, uh, to follow Jerry's question, will there be no outdoor visits starting tomorrow in Snohomish County? I believe outdoor visits that are physically distanced and uh, that um, 
involve the use of face coverings and symptom screening for the visitor are allowed. There's a, I think a number limitation on them. It might be one or two individuals uh, that I, I don't have that guidance right in front of me, but we will certainly uh, make sure that that the Department of Social and Health Services is, is making Snohomish County long-term care facilities aware that they are in phase one and should follow those, uh, that guidance. Okay, and uh, last question. The state has a pretty active um, public education campaign on COVID-19. Uh, can you describe any separate public education efforts of the county and health district, how much money is earmarked for the effort and how is it being spent? Well, uh, we, you know, we have the uh, uh, ongoing uh, public information program. There's, uh, there's these press, press briefings. We have weekly press releases. We put the data up on the website uh, and then uh, we have a blog that it has a lot of information, uh, usually one or two new updates on, one, on, on a topic or two weekly. And uh, we are, our, our, our communications team is also working on putting together some uh, messaging for social media involving community leaders uh, surrounding uh, advice and recommendations, reinforcing the preventive measures that, that Executive Summers and I have been uh, emphasizing all along. So I can't speak to the, uh, the, the dollar amount that's going into that, but it's a sig significant amount of our uh, daily activity. We have a whole communications team working on all these matters and coordinating with the, uh, the county's communications team. Yeah, I'd just add on to that. We, uh, did not sort of allocate a certain amount of dollars for public education that I'm aware of. Uh, there, may, there may be some, but we're using all the, the resources, our staff uh, in our um, uh, emergency management center, our joint information team as Dr. Spitters and our social media outlets to get uh, information out. We're also working with some other partners around the region that are involved in uh, public education campaigns and want to assist that. But uh, again, we're not targeting a certain amount of uh, dollars for that. And we did get a, a, another question under the wire. Dr. Spitters, the state has seen its first death in someone under 20, an otherwise healthy 19 year old. It wasn't this county, but is there anything you can say to parents or young adults about how concerned they should be? Well, uh, first, I, I, I wasn't aware of this, but I think time was eventually going to bring us here. I'm very sorry for that individual and their family and their other loved ones. So that's, uh, that's heartbreaking for them and, and certainly uh, another signal to all of us that while the, the elderly and the medically vulnerable are more likely to have uh, these sad endings, uh, it, it can occur with anyone, and uh, it's just on, on all of us to do our very best to try to prevent transmission to other folks uh, and, and, and by doing those things that, that we keep saying, face coverings, physical distancing, limiting your participation in gatherings, and keeping your social circle small. Um, but a very sad event for, for that family and, and and uh, I'm, I'm sorry to hear this. I think that wraps us up. Um. This is Kristen in the Joint Information Center. Thank you again for joining us today and for all of your questions. We're going to go ahead and wrap up. Please stay tuned for future media availabilities.